So yeah, so I started uh, working in uh, 1999, Fiber in the Loop, the fiber technology, Sonnet, etc. And then I moved to Geo Mobile Packet Radio Service, which was very, so GPRS had just come. Uh, GSM and GPRS were competing uh, with each other. And then I was part of the GPRS team, but then we were developing the same, extending the same thing to uh, geostationary satellites. Like uh, one of the customers was in March th uh, those days. So that is the, basically I moved from fiber to air inter interface suddenly. And I was part of the team which developed satellite link control. Uh, not going to detail, but yeah, sat, uh, satellite. And then I moved to Ethernet. But before the Ethernet, for a brief period, I worked for Alcatel, and we developed a digital subscriber loop at drop multiplexer. And that is uh, the time when the requirement for internet bandwidth was growing, actually early 2000, I would say. So yeah, so that is the journey in the past. But what I do now, from last one decade or so, is basically whether it is a boot up security, whether it is a software update, patch, image security, signing, whether it is certificate related signings, image signing, you know, uh, authentication, authorization, et cetera, kind of thing. And now, uh, lately from three, four years, Kubernetes security. But when I say Kubernetes, basically, because I work for Cisco and I work for data center group, uh, so basically, we, have, we don't have something which we can say that Kubernetes alone is our problem because we del deliver product application in this particular case, which has to work from end to end. For example, you have to take care of your user story. You have to take care of your uh, authorization story. You have to take care of associated RBAC inside the cluster, outside API access. And uh, as simple issue as like password management, are providing the access with the help of uh, uh, what we call certificate, or simple stuff like using a particular cipher. I mean, if you're really uh, delivering a, a final product to the field, and if large customers are deploying it, a simple problem can actually throw a wrench completely. So what I hear is not just the cool problem of Kubernetes, somebody is trying to use the token. They found the tokens in some way, and they are going to just mess up with the entire cluster. But there are other very simple problems because let's say in the older system, somebody used a very predictable salt for password hashing. That very simple thing became a big problem because in the end of the day, it's a security, a basic security problem, right? So I actually work on end to end. Half of the time I'm working with the customers. So even though I'm not the expert of a lot of things, I would say you could be expert of only a few things, I would believe. But then I'm exposed to a lot of things, basically, uh, if customer is doing audit of their system, not only just Cisco and other vendors as well, so they find uh, surprisingly low level stuff, very basic stuff, and basic problems related to security. Of course, nowadays, like I said, Kubernetes and cloud related problems are also there. So all of these experiences. So let's see. So let's take the problem one by one. So when it comes to secret management, whether this secret is storage or whether this secret is in what form you are keeping. So for example, let's say that uh, people in the beginning, they used one-way hash. It was MD5, then world moved to SHA-1, SHA-2. I think SHA-2 is still pre prevalent. And then there was a problem that even if you have hash, somebody can do dictionary attack, somebody can do birthday attack, and figure out pretty quickly uh, with the help of uh, you know available computing power. Uh, so even though these problems are of the past, basically, but these are still prevalent. And when it comes to keys, sometimes uh, keys getting exposed in log, or keys getting exposed indirectly because someone is able to read a bunch of data and keys is stored in an insecure way. So these problems are still there. On and off, they keep on coming. And then yesterday I heard about a lot, and you, in the keynote also it was mentioned that uh, there are serious problems related to authorization and authentication. So even though the people get uh, authorization part, uh, sorry, authentication part right nowadays, I, I see, but this authorization and this resource management and resource access, when the user type is complex and there are lots of internal user and then lot of API user, web client user, and then it becomes a mix and match unless you get the architecture right. So lots of problem I see that uh, you say that uh, operator user is supposed to be read only 
and then it has some access to this writable resource. And here come, comes a university, basically a student, and I'm giving him to play with the system with the operator role, and he can mess up it all. So I've heard it all uh, often. So these problems are also there. And then this all pervasive list of uh, ciphers, key exchange, max, getting you know deprecated over the year. And if you do not catch up, there is a problem in the sense that uh, out there in the dark uh, web, there is a solution from their perspective to penetrate or break that cipher. So this problem is also uh, I see very often. And then even though there are technologies to uh, you know, get rid of a lot of web client and server issues we faced in the past, for example, cross-site request forgery is one where you just send an email, click it to the link, the cookie in the browser is invoking a session with the active cookie and while it is done without your knowledge, right? So you see that uh, even though there is a, this CS, anti-CSRF technology in the web client existing from last, I would say, seven, eight years, but uh, many of these problems are still there. I would say that uh, on this note, I will give an example. Almost I had a problem with some kind of law enforcement. So I was trying to uh, fix uh, this CSRF, trying to find a solution for this various platform for CSRF. And then I was just poking into uh, you know, many websites I used. One of the websites I use for this uh, booking the uh, trails and uh, uh, national park system, recreation.gov, maybe some of you are aware. And this, there are some, uh, you know, trailheads are very competitive. You have to book in six months in advance, and it, when it opens, it goes away in a flash, basically one second, two second. So I sort of created a payload with Postman, the post payload to reserve something. And I was just playing with it just to see, uh, uh, I mean, I was just thinking that we are the only fool, so let's find out how about others. And they said, voila, I'm able to do any uh, uh, date reservation in advance, basically. Why? Because the front end GUI was blocking, but if you uh, uh, send the same call with the change date, the back end has no control, literally. So this, <laughs> so this kind of problem, actually, and this was 2021. So not so long ago. Now they have fixed, actually. So you go to recreation.gov has now one of the best uh, you know, uh, attack prevention, I can see that, because I tried you know, 20 different ways. Not possible, but yeah, so this is uh, quite crazy. And then you could say that uh, uh, Cisco as a company and many other folks are now moving to, even if they are not moving to cloud, but they are still moving to microservices-based architecture. It, it makes sense, because a lot of this monolith have uh, very big maintenance problems. and you know, hooking up to new functionality problems. So these are the functionalities everybody is moving towards. So I see a lot of this uh, container and pod policy and ac access issues because they are able to find token, they are able to find extra resource, they are able to read, they are able to uh, somehow uh, 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 make a, uh, a cube API which they, they were not supposed to. So these are the problems actually I still see in the field. Now, so those are the problems. In fact, there are more problems. I just categorized the fewer of them. And then, if you notice very carefully, and this is, this is just my assessment uh, of, uh, I would say that uh, maybe 50 Cisco product and 100 other vendors in, uh, in the field working with Cisco product, uh, all these big service companies and uh, big uh, uh, social company as well. So, when, so you see that in uh, keynote, uh, this was emphasized that do not take security as a layer that you develop a product and just security put on top of it. So even though things are changing, I would say, many products are being built uh, uh, with security in mind, but it's still it is quite prevalent that a uh, lot of assumptions were made at the time of architecture, or even today people are making, and those assumptions are causing trouble. One example I'll give you is that, uh, let's say you have a switch and router, and you provide access with some API. So you believe that the operating system, underneath operating system is not accessible because your API doesn't provide access to operating system. It provides access to whatever you have wrote for those API to return. But then you did not enforce some rules that the payload which is being sent in the API eventually going to cause some function which are going to indirectly attack your OS, basically operating system, right? So this assumption that your system is always closed and hence you are safe 
often is the problem. I would say that assumption should be is that uh, all systems and software are inherently insecure. You start from there, and then you probably, even if your system is closed and if you don't have a problem, you have not you know, lost anything because this is going to be any day better. Same thing with the tightly coupled in the sense that uh, you notice that uh, they are making, in Kubernetes I see very often, so Kubernetes, the, you are creating multiple uh, uh, node cluster, and then this assumption that from API external world perspective, they don't know it's a cluster, it's a one system, because your API just you are logging through one IP address. But the services are uh, you know, scattered in the pods and uh, containers on multiple cluster. So there is a way that the cluster is talking to each other. So then the assumption is being made that, oh, let's create a token, and this token is honored by the other uh, uh, node in the cluster by other part, and this token is some sort of a static, not known to outside, not accessible. But the problem is that someone can still be in your land, someone could be still in your data center, someone can install some malicious software in your cluster or in your machine, your laptop where you are accessing it from and get the access. So these tightly coupled assumptions uh, have caused troubles as well. I have seen many actually. So many of these big companies uh, who can afford, in our case actually, they take switches and router and write tons of application on top of that to manage uh, uh, themselves the way they want. That's where I see a lot of trouble and assumption being made and then, then things start you know, falling apart. So that is the uh, uh, second problem. And third problem is that, uh, you know, this is the olden days I would say, but I still see that uh, people say, you know what, I'm using a token, nobody knows, but because I don't want people to guess, so let's just encode it. So they are using base64 encode. It's there, I mean, you don't have to tell me, I, looking by the uh, bits and bytes I can figure out. And I, and I try once and it actually passes and I can see. So right, so, 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 so this security that I can't uh, read a string and then that's why it is secure is a problem, right? So let's go, so this is the architecture problem. And now, uh, so because I'm half developer, half talk, uh, talking with customer, so I still see I review the code and I write the code actually. So, there are basic problems, but you see that those who develop the code, that very simple. So first one, if you see, so if you are using the Golang TLS server, for example, or TLS client in this case, by default, that flag, skip verify is true means don't verify the server certificate. So often you are running a TLS pipeline where the pipe itself is secure, but the client is not verifying the server certificate, that is by default which means if I'm able to spoof the connection, I can offer any random certificate and hijack your connection, and you believe that it's a TLS pipe, so everything is good. I see it often, so this is, this is and, and there is a cut, some, some sort of open source code, those, uh, uh, I mean, even those have uh, uh, written like this. So I'm assuming that because of the testing, it's easier that you switch up the uh, uh, server cert certificate verification and get away with it, and either they forgot are actually there is an assumption that the end user is supposed to fix it. But sometimes it just goes like a package open source or our own and it just keep on happening. And second one, I think some of you in the field might have noticed that uh, even though this is the URL example, but this can also be part of the payload post call where you are exactly giving the name of the directory which you are trying to access, but then you don't realize that you allow relative, basically hopping the directory path, relative path. So even though after that question mark file, it's supposed to be my file, but I could write dot, 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 go back to the root and find actually ETC password. So I'm able to dump it. So you, you see these kind of uh, uh, what comes under the input verification that whatever is coming from a uh, web client or your API, server or backend is supposed to enforce. But there are cases where uh, lots of folks don't enforce it and that's why you are able to. So this is just example that one can read it, but one can also write it if there is a right privilege available. So that's the second set of problem. So, and third one, you notice that I have a key here, which is supposed to be secret, but uh, you see that uh, a read permission is given to all, if you see in the bottom right. So this is, I also see that maybe this, is done, this was done for the testing, but then somebody forgot to, you know, disable this read, read, read to all. I, why, do, why does every user on a system need actually read, read permission for a secret key? This is the certificate key, for example, certificate private key. So that's the, that's the uh, genesis of the problem. I mean, there can be many re uh, reasons, but the problem is that some are borrowed code, 
and some are actually uh, just lack of understanding, lack of exposure. And then one last thing is that developer's bias. Developer bias is that uh, as a coder, all of us uh, have a certain style, and we are very good at taking uh, care of five, but we don't care about the remaining three. I mean, this three changes from person to person, but then we, uh, all coders are basically subjected to some kind of bias and they make mistake. And then since we are talking about culture, and I will eventually say that we have to somehow uh, uh, work with the tester so that uh, the testing actually could find out something which we have missed here. But then if you have a cohesive team where tester and developers are quite friendly, they are able to convince each other. So, <laughs> so the test case which was supposed to reveal, I mean, this is a simple case, so they will find it. But there are cases where uh, it's complicated. And somehow developer is saying that, no, 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 this is good. This is not harmful because nobody is able to access it. And tester is saying, OK because tester somehow has a trust, and or vice versa. So, you know, that, that, that's the another problem. So now let's see that. So you saw the problem. One was the architecture. The other was uh, basically coding are the people who are working on the ground. And then let's talk about the team. Why some of those security problems actually come in, into the play? So most of us are domain experts. For example, if I'm working on database, or if I'm working on uh, running a web server, I'm not supposed to know a whole lot about certificate, certificate authority, and so on. So because they are not expert, security expert, and then there is a need that everybody has to have some exposure and skill related to security. In modern time, actually, I would say that uh, all developers and testers should go through a basic, uh, what we call a, a paradigm of security. I wouldn't say security training, but I will say security kind of uh, sensitize them that uh, they have to take care of top 10, these basic, basic stuff. Because what I have noticed this is all complex problems. All complex problems eventually are the result of very small mistake or bunch of small mistakes. It's not like somebody has a, a complex logic and one logic failed somewhere in the middle, so there is a problem. If that is the problem, still it's manageable because uh, attack vector is complex. But some of these things which I was explaining are very simple and easily available for the attack. That's the problem. So yeah, so I think if you hear uh, a developer, you have to understand that uh, some basic uh, security things you have to sensitize yourself to. And if you are like uh, part of the management team or taking care of a team, you need to understand that uh, over emphasis on just the product and product functionality, is actually going to bite back because sooner or later somebody is going to mess up your system in the field and then you know it will be difficult to manage. So what could be the approaches here basically to solve this problem in the team? One approach is that uh, you just think top down again. Often this happens that there is a bunch of, I mean, uh, there is a document or a bunch of uh, management or leadership team is saying that, OK, we have to enforce this compliance. So this is more, more or less compliance. I believe when we are talking about developing a product, compliance is not the problem. Because compliance, you can do testing and everything later. But the basic thing is that you have to start with incorporating those things. So this, is, this doesn't work, in my opinion. And the second is where is the team composition part comes. You can actually train some people, can be security representative. I'm, I'm one, actually. I'm call, called security champion. Uh, Champion is a, I think they, are, they say this, I don't believe <laughs> what's going on, champion parts. Anyway, so these security uh, rep can actually keep an eye, but I would say that uh, code review, amount of code, functionality, this just keep on flying left, right, and center. So these two, if you have a two, even two or three individuals, they have their own feature, their, their own uh, things going on. And in my case, half of the time, customer. So it's very easy to slip. So in my opinion, even this model doesn't work. I mean, if you believe that two tigers you are keeping to take care of many cows, mm -mm, not working. So, uh, so what, what is supposed to happen is this one, actually. The bottom, uh, uh, when I say bottom, basically I'm saying grassroots level engineers should be able to stick to basic sub-security and make it part of the design and development. So let's see how this is going to, so basically how this is going to happen. So you have some security expert who are committed, and then some of, I mean, a whole bunch of folks who are not committed, and your goal is that they are supposed to be one team, uh, and then 
all of them are actually looking after the security issues uh, at the architecture and design level. But let's see how. So this is the, this is, this, this is where my developer psychology comes that uh, I did not start working on security uh, like I was very uh, uh, wanted to do. I was just uh, trying to solve some customer problem and slowly, slowly, slowly I just got sucked into and became the security guy. But nowadays you notice that uh, security is very cool in the sense that uh, uh, you talk to many developers. I was trying to uh, demonstrate one simple developer that how your cookie can be misused if you don't have CSRF protection. And he was, his eyes were lighting up that, oh wow, he didn't know that uh, somebody can do this. I mean, I was just demoing. So it's very cool. Most uh, engineers today actually would uh, like to have actually. So that's the good part. So that has changed actually because uh, I would say that some brand value is coming with that fact. And uh, in a team, you notice that uh, if problems, security issues are coming from the field, for example, or even in the testing, then uh, who, who are you going to blame? Although blame, uh, uh, not just for the security, so any, any sort of blame is not going to help. What you are supposed to do is that uh, you find the stakeholder who are able to absorb the failure or celebrate the success without getting shamed or without getting, you know, too celebratory in an individual way. So I would say that uh, if you create a situation where lots of folk in, folks in the team actually understand this are part of this, then you don't have to, there is no question of shame or, uh, or uh, uh, you know, uh, being a hero, basically. And the last point, uh, I would say that uh, I was talking about roping on the uh, Dave and QA. It's a good idea uh, for, uh, uh, that if you have a system and architecture document and let the QA guys write test cases or use the tools without knowing your design. So you have a system spec, you just know the black box, let them design the test cases before, without knowing that there is a Kubernetes cluster or something. If you're doing white box testing, then you have to just let them know that here is their Kubernetes cluster without letting them know how you have actually uh, uh, made it work. So that, that is important because otherwise, I, let's say, there's a developer bias and there is a tester bias, both. So you have to avoid, basically. So yeah, so if you are a leadership team, in my experience, top-down hardly works. I mean, it might work in one or two situations where you have uh, a customer waiting and you have to do something, tiger team. But uh, in my opinion, tiger team should not be the you know, norm. So yeah, so no top-down. And then when I say security layer, basically make it part uh, from the architecture and design. Don't say that you know, we are going to develop a product and then we are going to fix security issues are going to provide security. That, that is going to land into the trouble. And then time and resources. So this is, this is where I think those who are uh, uh, developer in this audience are those who are managing. You always notice that the time is slipping and the resources are fewer. So it is up to the leadership team that you need to invest. Otherwise, uh, the cost of something failing in the field our cost of knowing something in the very last testing phase is higher than the time you would have you know, allocated otherwise from the beginning. So this is something I would say the leadership team need to take care of. Developer, of course, spreading the knowledge helps not just for your own sake, but also for the team's sake. And it's a good idea that people know that you are an expert because you are able to just explain, share, demonstrate, right? And this is the part Share, share, share the blame in the sense that I'm not saying that you blame. I mean, naturally, if there's a whole team is responsible, then the blame is shared. Nobody individually is responsible for the failure, right? And yeah, so this is the part. So this is the part where I would say, long ago, I had this training of competence maturity model. They said that you have to, you don't have to have two type of personality in your team. And these are the term which I'm about to use. This is cow and tiger. So this is, if you're, Quality guy is cow, then he will be convinced with the, any idea that, okay, this is okay to leave or this is okay to accept. And then you have a tiger personality who is going to throw a wrench without taking things into account. So I would say that tiger, that is heroes or zeros basically, uh, don't create in the team. Let the entire team be heroes, I, I, I would say. So this, this whole, so you, you, would, you would notice actually in, uh, not in some uh, all situations, but in some team and some situations where one or two guys know a lot, and if they are on PTO or they are off vacation, and if the problem comes, everybody is just thinking what to do next, right? So that's the problem. So you have to avoid heroes and zeros. Basically, 
All of this is when creates the culture of actually what I'm calling what I'm calling security as a culture. And in conclusion, issues can add up quickly for sure if you don't take care of that very quickly actually. And bottom up works better because you have a basically way to uh, incorporate things at the architecture and design level which are going to be helpful. As simple as that, like not. Uh, uh, disabling certificate enforcement or not uh, what we call enabling other security enforcement and so on. And then, so this is important from an engineer perspective. If you are in engineering team de uh, developers, you need to understand that uh, you just don't have to stick to your domain. You have to know your left and right and security is one of them. So this is going to add to your, you know, I would say skill and it's good for your career, it's good for your knowledge good for your uh, standing in the team, actually, I would say. And then, this is mostly from the leadership perspective that you have extended uh, talent pool, so you don't have to rely upon heroes or you don't have to call somebody zeros. So if all of this happens, this is what is going to achieve security as a culture and distributed advocacy. So this is, while I have concluded, one more thing I have to share before I get done. <laughs> This is Mount Whitney. So <laughs> it took me uh, about 17 days to hike 179 mile, and I reached there, right? So this is, this is why this picture is important, because this is the uh, uh, site I was trying to hack to get that, uh, because I lost lottery for, this is very, uh, 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 this trail is in very demand. So I failed for three years those lotteries, then I tried this poking postman, etc. so I found a way. So, but I thought that, you know what, uh, uh, the log or somebody is going to say that somebody <laughs> resort is before, etc. But anyway, I, I, I was not comfortable with the idea, so I called them. I called them to raise a CVE on their product, actually. And I did not know how to raise CVE because I have not raised CVE myself, basically. So then I was talking to other folks in Cisco who actually generate the CVE. So they said, you know, before generating the CVE, give them some time. So then I had to actually sit with them and explain their technical team, app team, that what is the problem, what is not. And then when I was talking to manager that what happened to my uh, permit, so he gave me the permit. I don't know where he got the permit from, but he gave me the permit, that's how I completed. Yep, so now if you have any question, I can answer. If you don't have any quality, let's say, so see, you don't have the, I would say, last leg of the defense, right? What we call. Yeah. So if you don't have last leg of the defense, you have to rely upon peer, basically, review, mostly, or peer enforcement. What I do often, that when I'm developing a new feature, I do not, I mean, even though I'm talking to my QA team, in your case, it will be a peer team or whoever is actually, who. so basically in, you, in the end of the day, you are delivering a product with some testing, right? I mean, or not? Yeah, it's tested. It's, yeah, it's tested. <laughs> you don't trust developers to test their own code. It's usually yes, yes, yeah. That's what we're doing, so. That's why, so I would say that, uh, uh, while code review, I do a lot of code review, I believe that code review does not solve all problems in the sense that it can find some pattern. We are actually trained to find that pattern and some problem. But there is absolutely no substitute of a real testing. So I would say if you don't have any quality, then the developers need to actually test each other code at least in some meaningful way, if not the full QS suite, basically. Otherwise, in your case, you have to have, you have to rely upon tools now. At least run some tool, I mean, free or license-based open source tools, and you'll find, I mean, I'm, what, I, what I'm trying to say that I believe in my experience that there is absolutely no alternative of testing. You got to find uh, a way to do it. Among developer can be done, it is doable. So I would say you can do one thing which I have done is that write your test cases in the beginning as opposed to developing something later. So like I said, if you, if you know that you have a black box, here is the input, here is the output, and here is what it is supposed to achieve write your test cases, even the developers writing those test cases in the beginning so that their bias when it comes in terms of architecture and uh, uh, development doesn't come into the play. But I would say that uh, in your situation, you got to rely upon something more. I mean, it's quite untenable, it looks to me. <laughs> oh, no, it sucks. Yeah, it's awful. <laughs> That's why I'm asking your opinion. <laughs> yeah, I would, say, I would say that under the circumstances, if you don't have any uh, QA team, I would say that writing test cases are just discussing that uh, as a devil's advocate in the beginning might just give better picture and if people follow that at least should work.
because bias is about to creep in in between. Once you have the idea, once what is uh, on the ground, there is a whole lot of bias coming at every stage. So if you have written some uh, rule and some testing, here is the input, here is the output in the beginning, maybe that will be helpful. Thanks. I would say, yeah. It has to be something more engaging, I would say. I have taken gazillions of training uh, in non-security area as well. If you ask me, mm, gone. <laughs> so it doesn't work. I would say, I would say training is, is a complement or adding to something, but not the solution itself. You know, something has to come within, something has to be, uh, you know, more, uh, I would say, sublime there in the team. Uh, I mean, uh, so I would say if I'm leadership team, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to find a way that, for example, let's, let's, let's have a way that everybody is going to find two security problem or everybody is going to just play with the system and just share their observations, something like that. Uh, or every, uh, you, I mean, if, if five of us are there, then we are messing up each other code or each other functionality and see what we find, something like that. I mean, it could be in the form of a contest, it could, it could be in the form of a reward-related benefit or something. Uh, uh, I think in the keynote, somebody was saying that, uh, uh, provides some kind of reward mechanism for your career or something when you write the open source code. I mean, those are for the commercial companies. I would say something similar. Something has to be tied to motivation as opposed to something. I mean, training part when it is coming from the top is still top down, I would say. I should be able to decide that, oh, I don't know this, so let's see. Let me go through this YouTube video, this training, or this something. So if I decide as a developer, bottom level engineering engineer, then that is, that is going to work better. And this is something need to be understood by the uh, leadership team. Often uh, in commercial uh, environment, there is this fight with the time, like few weeks, and then uh, uh, number of people. So you see that uh, there is a complete, hot, especially in the software uh, 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 world, I would say, before the product is going out, depending upon how big is the product, last two months or last one month or last few weeks can be crazy. And that is where guard rails actually go down, both in terms of testing, because I noticed that in some cases, we have this 60 problems known, and then we are discussing which one is less severe so that can be shipped with that. And then, I mean, if you're doing that with good you know, faith, that's fine. But then there is a competition that, no, I believe it's very severe, but the other guy believe that it's kind of not very severe. So when you start competing at that level, you know, all bits are off because you are just gut feeling. There's no empirical evidence, etc. So I would say uh, it has to be more, uh, uh, you have to empower basically people so that they can take their decision and they start taking interest in one way or another. You have to find your own ways depending upon the organization and the structure, but you have to do it that way, I believe. I mean, it, it has never worked for me, so I would say mm, doesn't work. <laughs> Again, there are many real examples what you just said, even I have de dealt with. So first of all, basic security. For example, if you are providing a web client and server, moving from HTTP, HTTP to HTTPS and moving that you are now enforcing the certificate check is not a feature. So first of all, we have to understand that security is not a feature. The basic security is the part of the platform. It's like your operating system, it's like your kernel, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, and I, I have actually uh, fought with many folks uh, when they start saying that, okay, let's do this later, et cetera. But that's my job. I mean, I'm sure everybody doesn't agree. So I would say that the basic security, I would say, need to be part of the infrastructure as opposed to feature, means that should be your, what we call, uh, uh, that bar below which is everything is kind of danger. So you have to set that bar that these are not feature, this is part of the infrastructure. If you deliver a product, it got to be there. Then you can discuss on top of that uh, some feature. For example, uh, if you are using a simple, uh, let's say, authentication uh, mechanism using password, you have a one-way hash uh, salted password somewhere on the system and you are storing, right? I mean, you can make it secure so that it cannot be accessed, but there are, uh, the world is moving that no password or hash should be on the local system where you are actually doing this authentication. It should be remote, some kind of vault. That I will call feature. I'm willing to make some compromise there because that does uh, some good, but it's a feature as opposed to very basic security. I would say that uh, you, will learn, you will learn with the you know, hardware potentially. I mean, we have, at least I have in many cases that we, 
underestimated a few things and in, in the field it just like caused a lot of trouble and then I would say that culture changed after that. So you have to let your team and the people concerned know that uh, this philosophy that security is needed only when there is a product. I often hear that. The let's develop the product. Why We need security only if we can deliver a product. That is the first argument. Because the timeline and resources are actually tied to the product, right? But if you say, what is the point of delivering a product which is crap from the day one, right? That's the basic simple. So, so basically, you have to make that argument. I mean, I, I would say that I. Uh, just my experience suggests that you have to treat it like an infrastructure to the extent possible. <laughs> Anything more? Okay, guys, so thank you for attending. Thank you very much.